Doshi and I had watched. I had to click on it for some reason. All my well-planned actions throughout the day turned out to have been nothing more than a reenactment of what Satoshi had done. Satoshi, had he really been in the same situation as I was now? You know what, I'm gonna look at the achievements here, because, like, depending on how many what achievements are left, will reflect on, like, how much of the plot is left in this chapter thing. So, a moment. Yeah, there's still quite a bit of plot left, but I think we're very near the end now. Damn it, now I have to click on that again. The friends he had gotten along with had changed suddenly, and for no reason, at least none that I had noticed, planned to kill him. And fearing for his life as I am, he got the bat to protect himself and carry it around every day to practice his swing. And then one day, suddenly, he transferred my blood and gold, causing the prickling sensation to course through my veins. Nothing near my heart is radiated onwards, and the top of my head to the soles of my feet, chilling every part of me without recourse. What did she mean by transfer? What did she mean by transfer? Was Satoshi still at wherever he transferred to? Was he the only one who would be able to understand me? Would he be able to tell me why it all ended up like this? More importantly, where did he transfer to? What did she mean by transfer? What did she mean by transfer? Before I knew it, I was at my front door. The frigid knob was hard to turn. <laughs> that word. Frigid knob was hard to turn. <laughs> oh, immature. There's nobody home. It wasn't that odd of an occurrence. Oh, wait. I don't know, actually. I wonder. We'll see. We'll see soon enough. It wasn't that odd of an occurrence. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the single key attached to my first single keychain. Remember that? Oh, those were the days. Back when the plot hadn't gone all, like, conspiracy theory and just batshit shit, crazy shit. I stepped in the entryway just as I was about to take off my shoes. A chill ran down my spine. Somebody entered right behind me. Like a classmate messing around, standing right up against my back. You're kidding, right? Just <laughs> my imagination. Logically speaking, it was impossible for me to be able to hide that presence. So I had my personal space all the way through the door. But there was undoubtedly someone behind me. Hey now, hey now, Keiichi. How do you know they're even there, though? They're behind you, even though they're behind you. Because I could hear the sound of flowing hair. What? Does hair even make a sound when it flows? There's no other reason I'd hear that sound but it was the prisoners. I mean, if it does that sound, it'd be very freaking quiet. Because I could hear the sound of them blinking again. Does, does blinking even have a sound? You'd have to have heightened freaking hearing for that, I'd imagine. Keiichi, my baron, there's no way you could hear that. Most of the instant that anything else that was warning me of the presence common sense just told me that it was just my imagination. It was just my imagination, there was nobody behind me. I began to reach the mental image of an eerie figure standing behind me. But at the same time, I asked myself, if there was nobody then, what was I feeling? Did an uncomfortable sensation crawl up my spine? Actually, wouldn't it be better if there was somebody there? If there was nobody there when you turned around, you should be able to accept that. I'd be able to answer all those questions up by looking behind me. But I didn't have enough courage to even do that simple task. It's so weird with that, isn't it? Just like, oh, just like, like, oh, there's someone behind me. It's just like, one way of doing it is just like, look back. It's like in horror in general. Like, are you just like, no, nope, don't look back. Don't look back. And you know, sometimes, like in horror, well, obviously in horror, it could be. Or it'd be like one of those moments where a character like tensely turns around and is like, you know, suspenseful music, turn around, nothing. 
Turn back around. Boom! Jump scare. Like, ah! Cliché, though, isn't it? Oh, right. I could try speaking to them. The person behind me might answer me. It was a random force. I didn't care how I went about it. Just as long as I didn't have to turn around. So I calmed down and thought about it. Would have known that that wouldn't have solved anything. Uh, who is it? I spoke in such a horse but Who is it? Because I thought I couldn't believe it was my own. Who is that? I could almost feel them contemplating their response. I felt it. There's no way I should be able to do that. Calm down, Keiichi. It's all in your head. That time I was certain I heard it. As if hesitating, trying to answer my inquiry. I was certain I could hear the sound of somebody inhaling. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it clearly. It was a girl, a young girl. I didn't know who, but a tiny speck of courage in me, however reckless it was, inspired a primal yet fitting solution to this current predicament. A scream! All the force in my body released from my lungs and through my throat, ceasing all thought process in my head. Suppressing all my thoughts and emotions, I began to collapse like a house of cards, somehow managing to twist my body and look back as I did so. It was definitely there. Right there. Somebody was there. Until the moment I turned around. Until I brought the area behind me into my field of vision with my hammy voice acting. They were definitely there. Well, hammy reading, really, isn't it? This isn't technically voice acting. Well, could be seen that way. Falling face up, my eyes traced the remnants of the presence suspended in the empty space. It couldn't be. They were invisible. They looked like they weren't there, but were they actually still standing there? As I screamed all the emotions I was holding back birth free in a violent wave. However, I was decidedly calm as my emotional dam collapsed. A turbulent wave of pent-up emotions was skillfully diverted into a torrent of aggression. That emotion is definitely required to extricate uh, myself from the bizarre situation happening right in front of me. Can you imagine if I read audiobooks, like, professionally? It would be like a combination of stupid voice acting and me trailing off random about rambling on about whatever and they'd be like i paid money for this freaking audiobook right and the guy who's like reading the story half time keeps bloody rambling in my state of heightened lucidity i entrusted my body to the fury the metal bat held firm in my right hand as if drawn there by a magnet a mid-level sweep would be the hardest attack to dodge i remember reading something like that on a book about swordsmanship or something Brandish my will to fight! The after image of that sound of of metal rushing as it swung from left to right, beating against the entryway. <laughs> the bat slammed into the right wall, the tip rebounding violently. Very calmly, I transferred the force of the rebound into a sweep to the left. Very calmly, my ass. The door of the shoe cupboard was split into pieces. Those two swings whipped through empty space, but they seemed to have a great psychological impact on the enemy. I could feel the panic emanating from that space. The attack wasn't the only thing required. I extracted the bat from the cupboard. It was him and Betty Day, and then screams I spun my entire body around in a large arc. Ah! And my scream shook the air. Embearing my ferocious swing with even more destructive power. And. <laughs> Without some mercy, I restrained my lungs trick with certain, a fateful force behind it shattered the top of the cupboard. Are you gonna explain this to your freaking parents, KG? It's like, why did you destroy the shoebox? None of my attacks struck the enemy, but my ferocity had certainly seemed to impact them. Breathing heavily, my entire body soaked in sweat. The invisible enemy there, but not there, dispersed. When I was certain that the enemy had retreated, I locked the front door and left it in. 
no way had it been a plane retreat was now inside my house. Once again, I channeled my vision and searched the house for the present. But it was gone. I succeeded in turning it off. At that moment, the tension drained from my body and I let out a deep sigh of relief. All the emotions I'd been holding back chaotically emerged together and began to flat out. A hodgepodge of theater accomplishments and disbelief all mixed together and began to flow through my body. Unable to deal with each individual feeling, I beat them all back for the strongest exhaustion. Even in this moment, I remain composed. Yeah, yeah, certainly. After checking that all those throughout the house a lot, I went up to my room on the second floor and closed the curtains. I straightened my back and tilted my head back a little. After clearing my mind of all my iron thoughts, I managed to calm down even more. What was that at the front door? There's definitely something there. Thinking about it, maybe it was just an apparition I dreamt up in my convinced state, but I really didn't think that was the case. Calm down, Kate, you might borrow. Compose yourself. And no matter how calmly I thought about it, what just happened was nothing but my imagination. It was obviously a supernatural phenomenon, and without a doubt, something was behind me. Remember back when he was trying to think about the whole case rationally? Just like her. It's clearly the work of man, but he threw it out of the window now, hasn't he? It wasn't some sort of illusion I saw amidst my confusion of disorientation. Proof? I had just one piece. When I asked who is it, they inhaled as if they were about to answer. That sound had clearly reached my ears. The situation I was in right now was still unclear. How I'd been possessed by the supernatural phenomenon known as by sheer son's curse. While this was a ruse by the villagers who believed in it and were imitating it. Either way, their motives were unclear. The roundabout way it had been done was also still a mystery. If it was perpetrated by humans, that would mean admitting that it was red and the rest them doing it. But it would be solvable. We should send an arrest and police would surely arrest my enemy. But if it was a manifestation of Yoshira Sam's curse, I wondered what would happen. Uishi-san very clearly declared that curses didn't exist. That time those words were pretty dependable, but as things were now, with the rising possibility that the perpetrators were not human, he suddenly seemed quite unreliable. If I told Uishi-san that this, this was the work of Yoshira Sam's curse, what would happen? I couldn't imagine his reaction, but it would be without question that a void would expand rapidly between myself and Uishi-san. With me having so few allies to begin with, and not being able to confidently declare whether or not this was a curse or not, there was no merit to doing that. I better keep the facts of what just happened and not the doorway to myself. It would be better if I didn't add what happened there to the memo behind the clock. There was still the ever so slight possibility that I was actually confused when I thought I was composed and I was just going berserk in the entryway. How wonderful would that be if that was really what happened? It would be able to refute Oyashira-san's curse. If I denied Oyashira-san's curse, then that would mean admitting that Rena and the rest were the perpetrators. If I said that Rena and the rest weren't the perpetrators, then that would mean believing in Oyashira-san's curse. By denying both of those, I'd be admitting that I myself was losing it. The three options from which I couldn't choose became a dilemma of sorts. Trilemma. They mixed together and formed a world all in my mind. Much like the plot of Higurashi in general, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, very confusing. Like, yes, this first arc is confusing enough, but when we go on to the other arcs, it becomes even more confusing. Once again, I straighten myself and lean my head back slightly to pull myself down. Calm down, Kaiichi. Accept what has actually happened as reality. Or think of anything more than that. I couldn't help but think of it. How wonderful it would be if it turned out I was just delirious and everything up until now was a figment of my imagination. We are sure someone's curse will exist and I would certainly be bestest buddies with Rena and the rest. I would have to be crazy. It was the first time in my life I'd ever wished for such a feeling. And scene. 
knots, because it keeps the knots. And there's that music again, the fur wrangles and downs. Yes. Generally, they have no call to me, so I never really. <laughs> Bird just scared the shit out of me. I literally jump on the bird to silly trap there. So you got all this tense freaking build up in the plot, man. Birds quiet for freaking ever, and then like, give me the pizza, ah! Generally, there were no calls for me, so I never really answered the phone much. But since my parents weren't here, I had no choice. I scrambled off the bed and went downstairs. Well, this is my bar residence. Actually, this is mine. I initially had a bad feeling about this, intuitively. It was because I thought she was going to ask me to go out and buy some things. So I took the initiative. What? I don't mind having instant noodles for dinner. There's still a lot of them. The other day we went out as a family and bought a whole case of cup noodles. I wanted to get a bunch of different kinds, actually, but there were few since the individual packs were expensive. So instead I got a whole case of the mega-sized pork food. Then ginger flavored one that I liked. My parents don't like strong flavors and didn't touch any of them, so the cupboards were still full of them. So, you see, there really isn't a need to go shopping, right? Gucci, I'm not asking you to go shopping. Look, Mommy and Daddy have to go to Tokyo right now because of work. Huh? Right now? This was really nuts. No, we're already here. We left this afternoon. It's quite a distance to Tokyo from enemies out. Running in full speed down a highway would still take six hours. Dad has a license, but since he doesn't like the highway, that's a likely to train. Well, you know, the train's a lot faster. I'm sure it's the 80s where this takes place, but I imagine they were fast then as well. Ish. It would have taken longer. <laughs> Not nowadays, would it? With those bloody Shinkansen. I'm thinking you might understand since you heard us speaking last night. But it has to do with Daddy's contract. Like now things aren't going so smoothly. Now that you mentioned it, I did remember that they had talked all that time about how his job prospects were looking to do. But he's really sensitive about things like this, so if we leave things as they are, it will affect his work. And on my father, particular fragile artistic personality. His emotions change as easily as the full sky. Could also just say he couldn't take criticism. But something like that can be done over the phone. Richard, this is your father's job, so can you support him a bit, please? Anyway, it's just faster to talk about it in person. So if there wouldn't be any misunderstandings. And if there's some, there was nothing more I could say once I started talking about work. So we'll be back tomorrow night. Kitchen, will you be fine on your own? It's not like I'll die or anything. Kate, you shouldn't speak so lightly of dying. If there's something troubling you, just talk to us. I believe Mommy will be able to help out. Yesterday I did bring up if I died rather abruptly, so I suppose they were a little worried. But really, I was more impressed by the fact that nothing would be stolen by telling them. But I didn't plan on that. At least, not while I still knew nothing. I never had hours. <laughs> Again, he's just like, he's like, yeah, they could kill him, but as long as, like, you know, he learns the truth. I won't die, I won't. I'll survive even if I have to gnaw my leg off. Uh, yeah, see you then. Tomorrow morning, make sure to wake up. And eat your breakfast. And don't forget to take a bath and brush your teeth. Yeah, yeah, see you. It all ended like that. Sometimes my parents went off to Tokyo for business meetings, but Tokyo was far away. No, they do things by phone. The times it did go were normally planned out in advance. Never happened this suddenly. I wouldn't say that all circumstances didn't feel strange or are unnatural. Anyway, I only need to recognize the reality in the situation. That's might. I'll the only one in the house. But when my parents came back from work, I'd be gone. Missing. Vanished. Looking back in the series of events to the previous five years of the United States and Christ. It wouldn't seem that strange at all. Yes, it bloody would, KG. Because if the case is where this whole thing is, someone dies and another person gets teamed away, right? That's already happened for the year, KG. Doesn't happen to two people. Well, it happens to two people. One dies, they all get teamed away. That already happens. 
Stop attacking died Meon. But no Mio, or whatever Takano is missing. So there you got it, man. I don't think we it's safe again pretty late. I didn't think it was good that the only one going in the whole house was from my room in the second room. It was the same as broadcasting to the enemy that my parents were gone, and this was their chance. First I ran to the living room, clicked on the lights, and turned the TV on to a reassuring button. Next was the study. I similarly turned on the lights and some music. At this from the outside, it would look like my parents were here. Once again, I went through the house, checking to see if there was anything left unlocked. When I sort of ran down the laundry still hanging out there, I went pale. That would have made it too obvious. I need to take it down. I snatched down the laundry half-heartedly and erased all traces of my mother wasn't there. It should be fine now. Ah! Go up the garage! Well, I hadn't gone all the way to Tokyo by car, but they had gone up to Tokyo and the mayor station. The garage was empty, wide open and in plain sight. That was not good. I panicked and rushed out the back to close the normally and grabbing the garage door, which should be fine now. Ah, I need to get the paper. I almost got the paper since they left in the afternoon, the evening paper is still out there. My premonition was correct. I pulled out everything from the mailbox and dropped it in the hall everywhere. For this, for sure, this time, it should be fine. Come on, thank you, man, leaving the cupboard box that like that for my little freak out was kind of bad. I'll just say I tripped and fell, and the band I was holding smashed into it. Whatever you say. <laughs> Even so, just leaving its current state wasn't good. I should clean it up a little before my mum got back and scolded me. I remember that there was a real good plan on calls, so I was going to get them the phone line once again. Oh, this is uh, my bar residence. Uh, who is speaking? Oh, this is Kate's tune. It's your mother around. Ah, uh, she isn't here at the moment. Who's speaking? You idiot, Kate, to my bar. So good for you and your parents are gone. Oh, well, we can fall off still. Calm down and take care of it. Uh, I think she'll be back soon. That wasn't a good response either. Now they might say they'll call again or to tell her to call them when she comes back. And that's fine. It wasn't anything important. Well, then, sorry for the bother. The scenario I feared didn't play out, or this in a sad relief. That call was fortunate in more ways than one. I'd have to deal with more telephone calls coming in from my parents' lights. I was somehow able to deal with the phone call just now, but I wouldn't continue to rely on such poor improvisation. I needed to make up a good story to explain that my parents were home but couldn't answer the phone at the moment. I've got a perfect excuse for you, Katie. Well, you see, my parents, they are home. But they're not. It's like, then where are they? Uh, they're currently having tea with the aliens in a spaceship above our house and can be teleported down at a moment's notice. It's like, what? For some reason, I think of the UFO ending from Silent Hill, like that type of thing. <laughs> Just bizarre. Oh, can you imagine that? Just like, Hinamizawa is now Silent Hill. And it was aliens all along! The UFO ending. They were making temper and couldn't st uh, step away right now. That wasn't good enough. They were sick and went to bed because they weren't feeling well. Was that going to be safe enough? The same valley on the way back to my room when the phone rang once again. It was like they were calling because I knew I was going to lie. They wanted to pick up. But I knew I had to. They suspect my parents weren't here. I should have just taken the phone off the hook under the pretense that I didn't realize that it was. But since the phone rang, I had to pick it up. I grabbed my cell phone and left it up the receiver. Hello. I stopped announcing this was my bar residence. I had no reason to be kind to someone I didn't know the identity of. But unlike my uncouth voice, the person on the other side sounded goofy and lighthearted. Hello, my apologies for calling so this is Oishi from the Okinawa pronunciation wrong. Okinawa Mia Bookstore. Oishi san? Not you, my Mara san. Good evening. Good to hear you're doing well. Oh, wait just a moment, please. No, no, no. I grabbed the portable hand set and rushed up to my room with this. 
It was the same no matter where I was since there was no uh, one else heard me. But I wanted to be in a spot that just felt a bit safer when speaking on the phone with a delicious hand. Ah, uh, sorry for the wait. How are things? Anything changed since then? Since then, when was that exactly? There was something about the brazen way you talked that rubbed me the wrong way. The last time I spoke with Asia Sam was two days ago. The day I stayed home from school, I met Oishi San on the way back from the hospital. I went to hear you to tell the lot of a call. We left there, ran right on Leon, came to check up on me. Whenever I spoke to little Oishi San, they always knew about it. It was like that since the first time I met him. Today's phone call may well be thrown out by them as well. Hello, can you hear me, my mark son? Huh? Ah, sorry. Um, what did you say? I asked if anything's changed since last time. There wasn't an answer, so I got a bit worried. Uh, uh, not really. The words stopped in my throat. But there was a ton of stuff that happened. All of it baffling. What should I talk about? I didn't understand any of it, but I should try asking. If I didn't ask now, I may never have no chance. It's not like my parents were there and I had no guarantees I would make it through the night safely after all. Well, we just said it. Seems that someone is after you. Really? It could all just be a coincidence, but the day I missed school when I was sick, the two of them came to check up on me. Which two? Or, uh, Rena and Mia. They started asking about how I had lunch with them. What next? I had with some mochi when they came to visit, but there was a needle inside. Fortunately, I somehow didn't swallow it. I wonder could that have been just a threat? About the needle. Um, it was just one of those common sewing needles you see all the time. There was a hole to uh, thread string through. Not that, my bar son. The needle itself. That's evidence. Could be used as proof that they thread me. Where's that needle? That's right. That's it. I dropped the receiver and rushed downstairs. When I tossed the mochi, I had overlooked it out of terror. But that needle was a valuable piece of evidence. I'd certainly thrown the mochi and needle at the wall of the gallery. If it was there, then it would be on the living room wall. Why, well, after two days? Was it two days? I can't remember now. But my prudent mo had cleaned that living room wall and there was not a trace of mochi left on it. Naturally. Could it be that it dropped in a gap between the wall and the carpet? I frankly searched by running my palm along the carpet, but nothing turned up. I tried moving around the sofa and desks, pulling up the carpet and flapping it around. But I couldn't find the needle. Did my mum clean up everything without noticing it? It was just two days ago. I didn't know what day they collected the uh, burnable trash, but may still be in the trash bin in the kitchen. I rushed into the kitchen, opened up the lid of the pail, and poured out the contents. But even at a glance, I could tell that it would be incredibly difficult to find a needle in this pile of trash. You know, they always like how that compares a needle in a haystack thing. Because it's hard to find, isn't it? And it's such a big... I mean, it's a trash can, essentially. But, you know, a similar thing would be hard to find, probably. Much like a guitar pick. Like, freaking... Yesterday, I think it was. I'd, like... Freaking... Open my guitar case, because like any time I go to the guitar lesson and come back, I just leave it in the case for the day. And then the next day, it was like, okay, let's play some guitar. And the pick somehow got caught in between the freaking case. You know, like like those little gaps? Like you get in cases and shit? It somehow freaking fell down there. Sneaky bastard thing. They're like socks. Hard to find once you drop them anywhere. Even on a bed, the floor, a freaking case, crying out loud. You freaking lose that in something as simple as to say, like, I don't know, a freaking. Well, you probably would lose in a handbag. Or a wallet, say anything. Anyways, I was looking for a needle in a trash pack. Oh, I know, I'll try and run in my hand through it. And then, ow! It was a bit gross, but I was looking for a needle. So I felt a small prick, I'll be able to find it. It was a pretty tactful method, but it was the quickest. I held my breath and started striking the pile of trash in my hand. Filth flew about. There was nothing more disgusting than this, but it was not the time to be concerned about such details. 
I continued on for a while, but nothing turned up. I went to the search more thoroughly, but I was still on the phone. I shouldn't keep police assigned waiting for too long. If we were none got back, I'd have to ask her if there was a need. I hastily began scribbling on a notepad affixed to the refrigerator with a magnet. Was there a needle? I scrawled the words with a red pen. I then dashed back up the stairs where I had been keeping a witch aside waiting for a party. Work. Been recording two hours now. I wonder if it's gonna go out of sync. Hello, how did it go? I couldn't find it. It was really overwhelmed back then and... I see. It would be great if you could find it. Keep it safe. That's right, the needle wasn't the only incident. I had to tell them about this morning with the hidden run. Uh, also, it's Sam, that is not. Actually, this morning. That van was definitely aiming for me. I could say that without question due to the circumstances at the time. Did you see the license plates? I can search for it from here. Damn! I just flipped out of yelling at him back then, but I didn't look at the plates. Most failures on my part with the needle and the plate number. Now, to be fair, he was preoccupied by something else, you know. Uh, I was so focused just to protect myself that I let some of the most important details slip out of my grasp. I punched my pillow annoyed at how it was. I'm sorry, I don't know much more than that. It was a white mask. Nothing to fret about, my boss. So anyone would be shaken up after being hit. I guess all this really isn't a coincidence, is it? Richardson started to hem and haw over on the other end. I could imagine him holding his arms. Also, Ren is acting strange. How so? What Ren has said on the way home today, asking why I was so much like Satoshi Kun. How I could say it with now, I could say it with confidence that Ren knew what happened to Satoshi. She knew that there was more to it than him just simply disappearing. Uh, Rena knows. She knows something regarding what happened to Satoshi, the kid who was deemed away last year. What would that be exactly? Rena said I was the same as Satoshi. She said something to the effect that the way things are going, I'll end up with the same fate as Satoshi. Fate, you say? Exactly what kind of fate did she say would befall? Um, transferring out, she said. Transferring out. Renner said Satoshi transferred out, so given how things are going with me, I'll transfer out too. Satoshi said, let out a stern sigh and then grumbled loudly. My bar son, that was probably some sort of fridge, or maybe some type of war. I thought so too. At that point, I started to think would it be prudent to sum up everything that had happened up until now as to. Um, Some human perpetrator. I do not. I keep that freaking word pronounced wrong every time. Although the theory of it being Renner and the others, I was left to where sheer Summer's curse actually existing as the only other explanation. You know, I find it kind of fitting that that last game that they played with the club was a detective game, essentially, Cluedo. Now it's like he's playing Cluedo for reals. Of course, I couldn't tell that to Wishes. He was another player, after all. <laughs> Except Ren's strange behavior could be proof of our scenarios. Well, was all your Shira Sun's curse being real, or everything being part of a conspiracy made by all of the villagers? Renna was involved. Renna had to know something. Renna was suspicious. What exactly was Renna? I couldn't help but think she was somewhere involved with a prior string of mysterious deaths. I seem to recall that Oishi san had admitted that he had dug into Rena's past a little. He's probably just downplaying it when he said a little. Meaning he had actually dug pretty deep, most likely. I want to hear about Rena. I want to know what happened at her previous school, among other things that were still unknown to me. If Rena was somebody I should suspect, no, not that. I want to know the truth. And I felt it alone in the same house. Even though I said I couldn't count on them, I had lost the security I felt I had just slide my parents' being around. It wasn't like this house was some sort of fortress or castle. 
A malicious person sighting is brute force to easily gain entry. There were no other residences close to the Rybar residence. No one would be able to hear anything no matter how loud it was. I had never felt as much resentment towards my father's autistic temperament than the fact that he had the house built in such a remote location as I did right now. I wondered if I would still be here by tomorrow morning. So I have to ask, right now, is not even going to comment on the bell there? Because I had no idea when the next chance would have come. Um, Risa and I have something I want to ask about. Please don't keep anything from me. Sure, ask away. Even though he was so far away on the other end of the line, this was the most reliable he had ever felt. I wanted to ask about Red. About what happened at her previous school. Actually, regarding Renner's... I noticed a sound that had been going on for a while now. Since I was so focused on the call, I hadn't paid attention to it at first. But I finally realized it was the doorbell. What could possibly happen? I'm actually going to record immediately after this. So just, what, just like wrap up the whole uh, first chapter story arc thing. But just in case it's end up going out of sync, you know. So I'm going to stop recording there. This will be like the end of the part and all that. And on the next part. But I'm going to record it immediately after, essentially. So, in a sense, I shall see you next time, viewers. See you next time.